This is Origin Stories, the Leaky Foundation podcast. I'm Meredith Johnson. Today on the show, we're traveling through 50,000 years of human history, following a trail of clues hidden inside simple beads made from ostrich eggshells. But before we get started, I want to thank our new podcast donors, Natalie Dybel, Alexandra Dumafte, Sandra McIver, and our other new supporters who wanted to stay anonymous. If you'd like to support the show and get a shout out on the next episode, please click the link in your show notes right now, or go to leakyfoundation.org and click the Origin Stories pop-up button. Your one-time or monthly tax-deductible donation will be quadruple matched. So if you give $10, we get $40 to help us tell new stories about what makes us human. Now, on with the episode. Humans and beads go back a long, long way. When we see something pretty or shiny, we want to pick it up, carry it around, and figure out a way to wear it so everyone else can admire it too. We string beads on necklaces, sew them into clothing, weave them through our hair. They're beautiful to us, but they're more than ornaments. When you wear a bead or hold one in your hand, you're connecting to an ancient, symbolic expression of your humanity. The oldest known beads are around 142,000 years old. They were found in a cave in Morocco in North Africa, where ancient hunter-gatherers collected seashells, poked holes in them, and strung them up to wear. And they must have looked incredible, because the same type of perforated shells spread quickly throughout Northern Africa and into the Middle East. My relationship with beads goes all the way back to the beginning of my master's. I just knew that I was interested in personal ornaments and the use of symbols to express our group identity, affiliation. This is one of the things that sets humans apart from the rest of the animal kingdom. That's Jennifer Miller. She's an archaeologist and professor at Southern University of Science and Technology in Shenzhen, China. And so I was really excited to look at early instances of ornaments and just see what information they could tell us about social identities, network connections between communities, um, ways of doing things, because these are tangible records of social connections in the past. Jennifer Miller first saw a prehistoric bead when she was a graduate student at the University of Alberta interested in learning about the evolution of human behavior. My supervisor had been working in Tanzania, and she had some of the excavated materials in her lab on loan. And she said, oh, you're interested in symbolic stuff. I've got two ostrich eggshell beads. Do you want to see them? And I said, yeah. The two beads were about the size and shape of a Cheerio. And it, it was like an instant connection. I was instantly in love with them, and I thought, I have to find a way to study these. Um, but she was not willing to let me study two beads for my master's thesis. After my first year, we went to the field to do an excavation and we recovered, you know, almost a hundred more. And then it became enough. And that's how, you know, my journey in, in this whole bead thing started. The ostrich eggshell beads Jennifer fell in love with came along later than the seashell beads from Morocco. The difference with ostrich eggshell beads is that they are the first kind to be fully shaped and manufactured and standardized. So they are mass produced throughout Africa and some parts of Asia in the consistent form and large quantities. And this makes them pretty exciting if you're looking at early symbols. With her hundred beads in hand and the go-ahead from her advisor, Jennifer started her research by looking into what other scholars had written about these early symbols and she was surprised to find that there wasn't much. Most of what had been done was focused on the last 2,000 years in sort of the Western Cape of Southern Africa. And they found that there was this size change in bead diameters before and after the spread of herding about 2,000 years ago. So there was a lot of debate as to whether this was uh, evidence of a new cultural style entering the area, if it was a result of cultural contact, creating the evolution of a style, if it was just an in-situ development of the foragers who existed there, you know, changing and evolving their cultural styles. These beads are still important and stylish today. In the Kalahari of South Africa, indigenous people still make and wear ostrich eggshell beads. 
and give them as gifts in a customary practice called haro, a word that is actually synonymous with the word for ostrich eggshell beads. This is a way to keep up trade relationships by offering up some kind of gift um, to signal your good intentions and that you want to maintain this relationship with people who you maybe don't see that frequently. Uh, and so that's one of the, the really important uses that it has served probably in the recent past and does serve today. So that got Jennifer thinking. Okay, so they've documented, they've looked at the last couple of thousand years in Southern Africa, but ostrich eggshell beads go so much farther back than that. And they're all over Africa and even into Asia. So we're only seeing a very small picture of what information beads can reveal to us. And so what would it look like if we zoomed out and looked at, you know, all of the oldest examples, which go back to around 50,000 years ago? Uh, and that drove me into the PhD question, which was what, what happens if I start documenting these? Will it tell us anything? Will it be a random pattern or will it reveal something more? To zoom that far out into the past, and see any kind of pattern through the little Cheerio-sized lens of an ostrich eggshell bead, she needed to collect data on as many as she could. The oldest examples were in museum collections in Eastern and Southern Africa, so Jennifer set off to document them. She loves whenever I say this, that I had a research assistant come with me who was my mom, and she was paid very poorly, and she would just help me. I would measure them and tell her the number and she would enter it into the data. We took photos of it. It's a very intensive, long, boring process to go and gather this data. And so I can understand why it hadn't been done before. Jennifer measured the inside and outside diameter and the thickness of each of more than 1,500 beads from 31 different sites spanning 50,000 years and 3,000 kilometers across southern and eastern Africa. It is the largest ever database of its kind. And then she had to analyze and compare all the data to find the story inside. The project was incredibly painstaking, and it took Jennifer a decade of work. It was 50-50 that it was even going to yield anything. After I collected all the data, I didn't do any processing for at least a year because I was just terrified that it was just gonna be a random pattern with absolutely no meaning. And I will have wasted all of this time and money to find, oh yeah, it doesn't, you know, there was no pattern revealed. Each individual bead, of course, had meaning. It was crafted by hand, completely transformed by the skill and intention of its maker. But it was impossible to know for sure that the beads had a bigger story to tell until she could really look at the data altogether. When I put it all together onto one graph, there was a distinct pattern between the Southern African beads and the Eastern African beads. And the pattern was incredibly surprising. The Eastern beads had a range of diameters that stayed consistent over the entire time span that Jennifer was looking at. And for the long stretch of time between 50 and 33,000 years ago, the Southern African bead diameters were the same as the Eastern ones despite being made on the other side of a huge continent. But then, the Southern African beads changed. And then they kind of disappeared or got small, and then they were much smaller, and then they were big again. So this, this difference in the diameters was on the order of millimeters. It's very small, but it was there. And so this spawned me to think about, what, what does this mean? Does it mean something similar to what the previous studies had found, just on a much a broader regional or continental scale? Could it be possible there was a period of cultural exchange between these far-flung communities from 50 to 33,000 years ago? The identical sizes of the bees in two regions, it couldn't be just a coincidence. These styles, if they were between disconnected populations, should be completely random. There's nothing about a bead that suggests what size it should be, except for our own internal conception. And this comes from our cultural community, the norms, the way that things are done. They were taking large pieces of thick ostrich eggshell and using tools to make the same size hole in the center and then shaping the outside 
smoothing it down to the same exact size and the same shape. And they were mass producing them. A bead could be anything, any size, any shape, but people were choosing to do it the same way. So if 50,000 years ago, people were making them in totally disconnected regions, that should be the most different that these styles of the beads are, but they're not. They're the same. And these are sites that are 3,000 kilometers apart, which I think is about 1,800 miles. So this is a a really shocking (laughs) find. And I was very hesitant to suggest that this might mean um, a social network. I was a, a PhD student, and this is much larger than any distance that had been suggested before for this kind of cultural contact. This could mean that people living 1,800 miles apart 50,000 years ago were somehow socializing and intermingling with people from farther away than anyone would have expected. In her dissertation, she explored other possible explanations. Every possible explanation I can think of, including just random chance, including um, some sort of limitations of the raw material. And the, the ultimate conclusion was that the one that fits best is that this is a shared style. And just like today, style has meaning. These items were worn close to the skin, close to our bodies. They've become part of us. And the origin of these decorative ornaments and these social connections in the past are really at the core of what it means to be humans. So if you think about the things that you're wearing right now, the symbols that we all decorate ourselves with every day, it might seem like, well, actually, I'm not really wearing anything that's symbolic, when in fact, this is such an inherent part of our culture that absolutely everything that we are adorning ourselves with is symbolic. One example is a ring you might be wearing right now on the fourth finger of one of your hands. In some places, it's the right hand. In North America, it's your left hand. This symbolizes your love and commitment to your partner. And it's a signal to others that you're not available. These are things that without even thinking, we just see and process. Every day, if someone is wearing a really beautiful set of diamond earrings or carrying a very expensive handbag, we might think, wow, that person has some wealth. They must be a person of status. And these sorts of information, especially when we're coming into contact with strangers, these are crucial for making sure that we have appropriate social reactions and are not causing unneeded stress. And so looking back in the past, this evolution of symbolic ornaments could be the start of people having more permanent social roles, people having inherited status or leadership abilities, people coming into contact with more strangers and having more extended social networks that you could call upon in times of resource stress. So these things still have fingers in our lives today, even though they started all this time ago. So the importance of these objects seems apparent. Why do you think people hadn't looked at them this way before? Yeah, it's an interesting question because people have been collecting them, finding them in excavations, storing them in museums for decades But it's only somewhat recently that they've become an object of analysis in themselves. And I suspect this might have something to do with the perception of them as just trinkets or kind of handicrafts. They're non-survival related items. So they're not quite as necessary as ways of procuring food, hunting, gathering, making shelter or clothing. These can be beautiful objects, but maybe not as exciting as adrenaline-fueled activities like hunting. But these tiny things actually serve a really important role in our group expression and identity. These are a tangible record of the ancient social lives of people. These overlooked trinkets held the earliest evidence of a social network, connecting communities over vast distances. How could that have happened? Did it mean people were trading or something else? This is the kind of stuff that I love to think about in the past. How could this have happened? It seems unlikely that somebody carried these couple of beads 
3,000 kilometers, walked in a direction they didn't know and kind of dropped them off there. The more interesting question to me is how could the knowledge of this spread even in the absence of beads? So physical objects can and do move on the landscape. I would suggest that ideas, styles, concepts, knowledge can easily travel even further than physical objects, you know? I see somebody and I'm like, oh my God, I love those earrings. Where did you get those? I imagine that these things happening in the distant past as well. And, you know, in this way, people connect with one another and we can see the evidence of it today. That's something that it seems nothing but these beads could tell us about our history and traditions that far back in time. Ancient DNA couldn't, and even stone tools because of the variation in the raw material that they're made from. Ostrich eggshell beads are made from a consistent material that's the same all across the continent, and they are entirely shaped by the people making them, deciding what they should look like based on their cultural norms. If the story in the beads ended here, it would be amazing enough, but this was only the first surprise. So, Jennifer, when she first arrived in our institute and she has to do a seminar for the whole entire department that based on her past PhD work. So she showed us this extraordinary set of data that has more than 1500 ostrich eggshell beads. But then at the end of her talk, she said, I also have data all the way back to 50,000 years and I have not really looked at those data, but if anyone have any ideas, I would be really happy to hear. That's Professor Yiming Wang, a paleoclimatologist at the Max Planck Institute in Germany, where Jennifer came to do her postdoctoral research. I was really fascinated by her data and I just want to play with it, but this really didn't happen until the COVID time because I was actually in the field when the pandemic broke out and we had to evacuate, then there had to be sort of a shift in focus of, okay, so now it's not necessarily about going out and gathering firsthand data from the field, because who knows when we'll be able to go back to that. But now it's what data have we got in hand and what can we make from this? At that time, most of the people were working from home. So only a few of us come to the Institute and we always sit there having lunch together. And Yiming and I, she and I were friends, we're colleagues. We have very different expertise and research focus. And she, she is excellent at statistics and at our programming. And so I said, why don't, why don't you take a look at this with me and we'll see what we can come up with. I said, yes, I'd love to look at your beats and do some stats with those beats. Yiming is a big data kind of person. She's able to look at massive amounts of information and find patterns by plotting it out in different ways. It's part of what she does as a paleoclimatologist to understand how climates changed in the ancient past. My data, normally they're like curves. So they show at a different glacier or interglacier period, the climate will be going up and down. There will be higher rainfall, lower rainfall, sometimes higher temperature, lower temperature. And so I will be looking at climate cycles if I'm doing paleoclimate reconstruction. and But this type of material culture data, which is really new to me, and that's why I find very exciting that I could look at them. The plan was for Yiming to play around with the data, plot the information out, and see what it looked like. But when I plot them up, and I just find this incredible pattern, right? So we see the beach size, their characteristic from East Africa and South Africa, were totally overlapping at the oldest time frame from 50,000 years ago to 30,000 years ago. And then after that, the beat in Southern Africa just disappeared for about 15,000 years and until they reappeared again at 19,000 years ago. But in the meantime, I see the beats, they were consistent, similar size in Eastern Africa. And then when I look at the Southern Africa, once they re- reappear, and the size of those beads are much, much smaller compared to the older times. So I thought, wow, this is very interesting. What Yiming saw was the same thing Jennifer saw, but with an added layer of meaning. 
Through the beads, she could see the shared cultural connection between the regions, and because of her particular expertise, she knew that the times the beads were the same matched up perfectly with a very rainy and wet period in eastern Africa. During that time, there was a major shift in climate that caused the tropical rain belt to move southward to a place called the Zambezi River Catchment, a huge area that happens to connect eastern and southern Africa. So I have been working on the climate reconstruction for this particular area. And I noticed that breakdown from 30,000 years to about 19,000 years, that disappearance of the beads in southern Africa, it's almost in the same time period where Zambezi got really um, uh, a lot of rainfall. Which made eastern Africa dry out, changing where people could have lived on the landscape because it would redistribute plants and animals. And the Zambezi River catchment got so much rain that this huge area experienced massive flooding, creating a geographic barrier that broke down social networks and severed the cultural connections that had created the shared style between them. So that was a very exciting moment that I just ran to her office shouting in the hallway and to say, wow, Jennifer, look, and it showed her the plot that I have, and I also told her, hey, look, I work in Southeast Africa climate reconstruction, and this time period that Southern Africa don't have so much beads or hardly any beads, it's very interesting. And then she said, ah, this is weird, because right at this period, right where you have this, this is happening globally. And I was like, oh, interesting. What are more global climate cycles that we should line up with this? I was confident how the Eastern Africa climate was uh, based on both reconstructed uh, paleo records and also uh, climate model simulation, which is indicating of where the flooding occurs. And when those climate records are matching, and I can see how the East and the Southeast Africa, they are opposite. And that's where it all started coming together with, oh my God, this is when the rain belt shifted. Oh my God, it it creates such a holistic picture of what was happening in the past because none of these things are in isolation. And so I think the more lines of data that we can pull in, it'll give us a fuller picture of the past and help us really connect with these ancestors and what it was like to be human so long ago. Yiming and Jennifer published their findings in the journal Nature, And this work provided the earliest clear evidence linking climate change and ancient human behavior. And then it all kind of came together into this 50,000-year story about people making connections and and then climate forcing these push-pull mechanisms of people connecting and people losing touch. Her observations about the changing climate and my part about bead styles and social connections is a direct correlation between climate change in the past and human behavior, which is very exciting because it's hard to extrapolate that far back in the past what effects environmental shifts are having on social behavior. But at least we believe that we are able to see this through the beads. A few months after Jennifer and Yuming published their research, another paper came out that echoed their results, but through ancient DNA. Those authors found that there was a genetic connection and genetic mixing between people of Central, Eastern, and Southern Africa between 80 and 50,000 years ago. And then between that time and 20,000 years ago, people settled into their regions, leading to the cultural variation and human diversity we see today. Clues about how our ancestors shared knowledge, connected, and adapted to a rapidly changing world were hidden in those little beads waiting to be discovered. It's our shared story of human adaptability, and it lets us look not only to the past, but at our present and into the future. So our current climate changing in a rate that is unprecedented. It has never seen such drastic change in the past 2.6 million years. This actually raises a question. Can we adapt to this fast? Because in the past, in the natural climate cycle, that humans has thousands of years or 10,000 years to adapt into a certain way of living. But now I think it really need a very fast adaptation and management 
or response to climate change. I think it's very important to really combine the knowledge from different fields that give us a fuller picture about our human past. Jennifer and Yuming are continuing their work and finding new ways to use these beads to discover more about our human story. And their database is open for others to study as well. Thanks to Jennifer Miller and Yuming Wang for sharing their work. You can learn more about them and their research by clicking the links in your show notes. This episode was produced with generous support from Leakey Foundation fellow Eddie Kisslinger in honor of his wife, jewelry designer Kathy Waterman. Her designs are inspired by nature and influenced by her study of and connection with ancient human history. We're so grateful to them for making this episode possible. Support for Origin Stories is also provided by listeners like you. If you want to support the show, your tax-deductible donation will be quadruple matched thanks to Leakey Foundation President Jeannie Newman and the Anne and Gordon Getty Foundation. Click the links in the show notes to donate now and let us know if you'd like a shout out in the next episode. This episode was produced by me and Ray Pang, sound design by Ray Pang. Our editor is Audrey Quinn, theme music by Henry Nagel, additional music by Blue Dot Sessions and Lee Rosevere. Thanks for listening.